So with another crazy week or slash day in artificial intelligence, this video is going to cover some of the most pressing stories that you most likely did miss. So let's not waste any time. One of the first things that was actually rather fascinating is the, I wouldn't say discovery, but the talk and the speak about the Sora model. Even though the OpenAI Sora model hasn't been released yet, there is still a lot of information surrounding that model that is shrouded in controversy. And one of those things is, of course, the training data for this model. So if you don't know when these AI models are made, they have vast amounts of training data that they usually scrape from the internet. And in this article right here, you could see that it says OpenAI training Sora on YouTube videos would violate the platform platform's rules. In an interview with Bloomberg, YouTube CEO Neil Mohan doesn't confirm whether OpenAI used YouTube videos to train its text-to-video AI model, but he says it would be a clear violation of the platforms if it did. He states that and I can't show the clip for copyright reasons, but he says that when a creator uploads their hard work to our platform, they have certain expectations. One of those expectations is that the terms of service is going to be abided by. It does not allow for things like transcripts or video bits to be downloaded. Um, and then the crazy thing as well was that, you know, last month and the reason that why this is such, I wouldn't say a huge debate, but the reason I, I, I would say that, you know, a lot of people were discussing this is because the last time that this was uh, a thing, okay, and there was a interview with Mira Morales on the inner workings of Sora when asked about the training data Mira Marati said that she didn't know where the training data was from she made a, a weird face people have been making memes about it um, and it's been something that you know has just been widely discussed as uh, like I wouldn't say a shot at OpenAI but I would say it, it's something that people are continuing to question because of course as you know before with DALI 3 and all these mid-journey and you know previous AI systems people are wondering where did you get your artwork from and, you know, are you going to be impacting artists with this, especially with video creators? It's like, you know, when you upload your content, you have a certain rights and, uh, you know, things that, you know, other people should abide by. And it's like, you know, if you're opening eye and you're able to train an entire model of all of this video data, where was that video data source from? So it's quite, quite controversial at the moment. One of the things that I don't think OpenAI would do anyways is release where they got the training data from. So I think even if OpenAI was going to, you know, get sued by someone, they would have to like, you know, get access to Sora, try and backtest it against certain videos and try and recreate those videos with Sora to see if there was any, I guess you could say, similarities in those videos. And I guess that's probably going to be the only way. Now, I don't think Google is petty enough to go after OpenAI for this kind of thing, but you never know because as the as the race heats up, it is really, really really crazy and we know that Elon Musk is currently going after OpenAI for various things so um, I guess it will be interesting to see how this thing kind of plays out because training data whilst it isn't the biggest debate it, it is a big debate in Sora because the video model is really good um, and people are wondering how they got it to be so so with that being said, uh, let me know what you think about that training data at the back. Next in AI news, we had Cohere introducing Command R, a state-of-the-art retrieval augmented generation optimized large language model to tackle enterprise-grade workloads and speak languages of global businesses. It says RR series model is now available on Microsoft Azure and coming soon to additional cloud providers. You can see currently the benchmarks in RAG are state of the art, which essentially means that this is the best model out there. Now, if you don't know what this model is and essentially how it's uh, different from GPT-4, basically this model is something that is i wouldn't say hallucination free but it is you know it kind of steers into that area where businesses need to work with their private data offline or you know for privacy reasons and essentially they just want to be able to have business solutions with that data that are really really effective so one of the key differentiators between this and gpt4 is that this optimization allows for in-depth analysis of documents that enables the model to deliver millions of answers efficiently and essentially you know a command r is built to specifically excel in you know rag and tool use and rag enhances the model's ability to access private data to power applications while the tool use feature actually allows it to interact with external tools and databases enabling a richer set of behaviors now the performance and scalability of command r are also pretty pretty effective we've seen that it is often more effective sometimes than the base model that gpt series usually has like gpt 3.5 or gpt 4 it's usually uh, quite a lot better than that and in addition there is also very very competitive pricing um essentially command r is usually cheaper than openai's gpt4 turbo making it a really really attractive option for enterprises looking to deploy ai solutions at scale without you know in 
incurring those high high costs that usually come with calling the model several times like i said before it's basically you know basically hallucination free i mean it's not but it's it's pretty much there now there was actually a very interesting paper that was called mixture of dex paper and this thread kind of explains why it's so important and the tldr which is the too long didn't read is basically that this paper just allows you to use less compute for these same kind of questions so essentially right here this guy breaks it down he basically says um why google's deep mind mixture of depth paper and more generally dynamic compute methods matter most of the compute is wasted because not equally not all tokens are as equally um hard to predict it says for example you need a lot more compute to figure out what is in the first token after full stop if you think about it planning the next sentence is a much harder problem than placing a punctuation and this is pretty much true it's kind of like similar to how humans think and it says in the idea ideal case the model should only allocate the exact compute it needs to accurately predict a token there is long and rich research behind these ideas and this is what google DeepMind showed with llm transformers he said it's analogous to mixture of experts that was essentially where you have you know smaller ai systems um that have domain expertise in for example maybe math maybe coding and then you essentially have that all combined into one giant model and that is able to be very effective at pretty much any task because you have you know six smaller experts or eight smaller experts that are fine-tuned on that specific area and it's able to do really well and he basically says that you know it's pretty it's pretty similar to that um and essentially you know it, it it's able to skip layers and in the orange area right here you can see that this is where compute savings are had and then this is where he talks about uh, the savings are further compounded when paired with mixture of experts and we're entering an era of scalable compute of llms tokens will not have fixed costs the machine will take the time to, it needs to think massive improvements for both gpu rich and gpu poor so essentially it's, it's like you know certain questions are going to be weighted differently than other questions and i've always thought that this does make sense because simple questions do like have simple answers and those are a lot easier to predict but um you know with a mixture of experts of course you're saving compute because you're not using the entire llm you're just using a subsection of that and then you know with this new thing where you're using a mixture of depths you can see that you know as the, like the compute you know the compute cost is just continually continually going down which is um really really good to see because like i said before what people don't realize is that yes whilst we do need uh faster chips and faster ai systems i can't remember where i read this ages ago but it's basically like uh i wouldn't say a hive mind but just if you think about every single you know piece of software every single gpu all of those things around ai all of those things are making maybe five percent improvements a month and because all of these things are improving at small areas you do get essentially a huge huge benefit over the long time and that's why these exponential growths can happen because if we now can have a system that you know uses less compute maybe it loses 20 percent five percent ten percent less you know you can now start to do even more things on top of that find out more solutions and it's just it's just overall it's not self-improving but it is something that is compounding which is really really good because it now means that you're allowed to get more out in terms of output in terms of the compute that you actually have and then we had microsoft's official blog and we had a breakthrough in quantum computing i wouldn't say breakthrough but the, you know they've just, they just been uh getting really really good at being able to do this so essentially what we have here is microsoft and quantum Tinum have made a big step towards quantum computing. They've basically created the most reliable logical qubit so far, and qubits are the basic units of information in quantum computing, similar to bits in regular computers, but much more powerful. Logical qubits are actually made from multiple physical bits. Logical qubits are actually made from multiple physical qubits and are actually less prone to errors, making them more reliable for complex calculations. And this is actually pretty important because this development is a big deal because it actually moves us closer to building supercomputers that can handle reliably complex problems that are much faster than today's computers and these could include finding new ways to fight climate change developing new materials creating more effective drugs you know just a crazy crazy level of discovery could really happen if quantum computing does get solved at the crazy level
Now, what was actually crazy about this as well was that by using a special system developed by Microsoft that checks and fixes errors in quantum calculations, they've managed to run over 14,000 experiments without any mistakes. And this achievement actually demonstrates a significant improvement in the reliability of quantum computers. So I'm actually intrigued to see, you know, what kind of breakthroughs we make in the future, because this kind of breakthrough could lead to a, you know, very, very exponential increase in what is capable because quantum computers are able to do so much more than a classical computer. Um, and it really does just go to show that we really, really could be living in a sci-fi world in the future, provided, you know, only a few breakthroughs are met. Um, but it just goes to show that the future might be crazier than we do think. So I'm going to keep an eye out for quantum computing because I think whilst many people think that, you know, it's something that is far, far away. I think once we do get certain breakthroughs, it's going to provide us with a whole wave of untapped potential that is just sitting there. Now, this is actually AI news or slash tech news. And the reason I think this is something that's rather important, but pretty hilarious at the same time. So this is a piece of news that, you know, I guess went completely viral because it's absolutely insane because a lot of people did think that on the back end, this was AI technology, but it just seemingly wasn't at all. So it says Amazon ditches just walk out checkout as its grocery stores. It says Amazon Fresh is moving away from a feature of group grocery stores where customers could skip checkout altogether. Now, if you don't know this, this is just an absolutely crazy. So Amazon Fresh has this store where they piloted it and they said, look, we have this amazing store where all you have to do is you walk in there, you pick up your products, you leave and you will be automatically charged. They were like, it's it's the first of its kind. It's a technological breakthrough. It's just amazing. It's called Just Walk Out. So it was a checkoutless grocery stores. And I've used these stores. They were actually pretty, pretty effective. You'd walk in, you'd beep your Amazon thing so it knows, uh, you know, that you're in the store. And then as you leave, you don't need to do anything and you just get your groceries. It was something that was really, really effective. However, however, there was something that they revealed recently. It says, okay, that though it seemed completely automated, Just Walk Out relied on more than a thousand people in India watching and labeling videos to ensure accurate checkouts and the cashiers were simply moved off site and they watched you as you shopped and this is something that uh, went completely viral initial tweet i saw i think it had 30 million views or 11 million views i'm not sure which one it, it did but um it was simply absolutely incredible because this kind of thing you would think that it was powered by some advanced vision system potentially you know like a vision model in AI, like some, some kind of, you know, accurate YOLO V9 or V10 or something like that with potentially maybe multiple cameras and multiple sensors. But it seems that they just had a thousand people. Now, the reason I'm actually talking about this is because I think that in the future, this is going to be really, really, you know, interesting because in the future, we won't need a thousand people in another country watching you uh, browse and do whatever what's going to happen is that you're only going to need an AGI level system, you know, with artificial general intelligence, it makes things like this possible. Because if checkout, you know, if this checkout list store didn't work simply because they just didn't have the technology, an artificial general intelligence system could actually provide us with the capability to do this. So with that level of, you know, understanding, we could now start to, I wouldn't say predict, but look at how at certain stores might actually operate this. Because this is why I included this story, because let's say like a thousand, you know, Indians or whatever, or a thousand people in another country, we know that currently, okay, paying a thousand people, whilst yes, paying a thousand people in another country probably isn't as expensive as paying someone in America, because, uh, the wages are significantly lower in those countries, I still think it's going to be a lot more expensive than just running a few AGI systems in a few vision model cameras and just making that more effective. And the reason I'm saying that is because it now gives us a look into the future with AGI, multiple different things that weren't possible before are going to be possible. Just like, you know, self-driving, you do need an AGI system to be able to take a look at things and not just like a vision model um, and a text model. You're going to need like an AGI level system that is able to, you know, interpret multiple different things, have really good reasoning and come to a great response. And I think what this shows us as well, like if you have AGI, I think this might be the future of stores because, you know, if you have a bunch of people, you know, you, of course, you're going to have to people that are going to need to uh, pack the pack the food, you know, undo 
the delivery trucks, all of that stuff, yeah, you're still going to need people. But in terms of, you know, cashiers, people doing the checkouts and stuff like that, I think that might be largely automated. And these stores actually did run pretty, pretty effectively. They did have different people, but it just goes to show that in certain cases, you know, your role isn't going to be completely gone, but you definitely uh, will be changing in that role. So people who were previously cashiers, they were probably just people who helped around, helped people find things in the store um, and helped, you know, load and unload the store in terms of certain things and just keep it running and make sure that everything's operational but of course that could be disappearing as well but with agi we never know because it's largely a singularity now another thing that openai have actually been doing is they've been you know training custom models for a variety of different use cases and i think this is something rather fascinating because it gives us an insight into what openai is doing on the back end they are doing a lot of stuff and they have been hiring a significant amount of people i mean rumors have it that remember when they had 774 employees apparently they've hired as much as 500 people in offices around the globe so it seems that openai is trying to become a behemoth in the ai space and one of the ways that they are doing that is by partnering with different people in different sectors and building custom trained models for different professions right here we've seen that harvey partners with openai to create a model for legal professionals and essentially right here if i just scroll down to this this is going to show you exactly what's going on so the prompt is what is a claim of disloyalty and this is something that is different compared to gpt4 you can see the custom trained model was preferred 97 percent of the time and this is a custom model that was trained on a bunch of legal data in terms of the way that it is formatted and in terms of the sources that it cites and we can see that gpt4 has a very standard response to this so what OpenAI are doing with a lot of companies, which is rather fascinating, is that they're building these AI systems that are fine-tuned and custom, like custom models that are going to be a lot more effective than we initially thought. Now, I do wonder how this is going to work once GPT-5 comes out. Are they going to have to retrain it again or are they just going to have to, you know, do it simply with the same process? But I think this goes to show that OpenAI isn't just, you know, trying to build the next gpt5 or gpt6 they are really trying to i guess you could say as i've said before come after the entire stack in terms of what's possible with ai they do want to be pretty much everywhere and it's clear now that open ai is going to be a major player in the space they aren't just going to be a company that has text they aren't just going to be a company that has a vision they are truly going after everything and i think if open ai currently since they have the market leader position if they're able to continually train models like this and go after certain sectors whether it be in healthcare in legal in accounting they could really be like i don't even know I, a trillion dollar valuation i mean it could be absolutely insane the amount of economic output this company could get because i mean companies are already using gpt4 and if there is you know a custom version like this uh all of that data is going to be you know going back to open ai all of that revenue not all of it but like a lot of the revenue the amount of uh you know calls are going to be going back to OpenAI's revenue so i think it's going to be very very fascinating and what's crazy is that they said what's next okay what's harvey tackling next they said of course um one of their main focuses is agents or how to combine multiple model calls together into a single working output this would simplify the user experience and reduce the amount of prompt engineering and typing users need to do the vision is for harvey to serve as a supportive member of the team because of course the volume of legal work is growing and associates spent countless hours on complex but routine tasks the opportunity we have not just with legal but with all professional services is to take care of the routine tasks so professionals can focus their time on client interaction and this is rather true a lot of legal work is just quite boring just sifting through files looking through uh you know i guess you could say uh, sources and citations for certain cases but um yeah it's very 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 fascinating but it seems that they've managed to figure out a solution and this is not the only customer solution that you know openai has it, on their blog they have so many different um things i will show you that, that that in a moment but it's absolutely incredible what OpenAI, like I said before, is doing on the back end. And on another one right here, this Twitter user points out in a recent OpenAI customer stories post on their site, they hinted at GPT-based agents.
relevant soon, taking basic actions online and in the real world. You can see that this is a company that is mainly focused on the future of email. And they state that what's next? Superhuman imagines a world where GPT-based agents will soon be able to filter, triage, and respond to email automatically, scheduling meetings and appointments, and taking basic actions online in the real world. The success of Instant Reply proves this agent-led email future is not too far off. And we know that OpenAI, their focus right now is of course AI agents. So the companies that are working with them stating that this is their next focus isn't a surprise at all. Now, the next thing that we have here is, of course, some speculation, but I think it's pretty, pretty wild. I won't be making an entire video on this, but it's something that you should be paying attention to. So essentially, there was um, some old domains from OpenAI. This is Jimmy Apple's an infamous OpenAI leaker, and he says, curious to see some people not understand all the testing, checkpoints, models, and research that OpenAI and others do. We don't have X, we call it Y. Model C hasn't finished, sitting on the last checkpoint, etc. Their old domains give you an idea and you can basically look through their old domains to see where certain um of course systems were in their phase for their training their red teaming or whatever now essentially there were these domains that were to interest of some people because they said very interesting things so for example we saw some of these domains that said uh evaluation leaderboard scientist internal at openai then we see um scientist internal at OpenAI, we see agent chat API scientist internal at OpenAI, and we see um, other ones that are very similar. So what it could be, I mean, this is some true, true speculation because we really have no idea what this could be, but we know that OpenAI, like I just already said, they're working on agents. So for them to have agent chat and for them it, for it to say scientist at internal at OpenAI, could this be a link where they were internally testing scientific agents that are doing research i mean it's possible openai have said that they define agi as when a system can generate new scientific knowledge and sam altman did talk about how he thinks you know ai being able to do scientific research is one of the most important things because that is going to give the most value out of any kind of breakthrough that we've ever had because if ai is able to generate consistent breakthroughs reliably that is going to be truly transformative for society so this internal links agent chat uh, scientist internal at OpenAI, it does give us a slight hint into what could potentially be coming. But then again, this is also something that could just be something that they're testing internally that we might never ever see um, because it is, of course, just a test. We also had this, okay, this demo right here, and this is to Infinity AI making history with the first completely AI generated YC demo day presentation. Let me know what you think about this. My name is Lena and I'm the CEO of Infinity AI. Actually, no, um, I'm not Lena. I'm an AI clone of Lena, and you are watching the first ever AI-generated demo day presentation. Infinity is a script to movie foundation model. You give Infinity a script and it makes an entire movie. Since we launched two weeks ago, our users have made over 2,500 videos that have gotten more than 320,000 views on social media. Our users have created everything from a math class taught by Kim Kardashian to a Macbeth play starring Elon Musk. My co-founders and I are engineering PhDs from MIT and Stanford. Before Infinity, we started our first company together, a profitable ML company that made over $10 million. We believe that a high schooler will create the next Seinfeld. Infinity is building the tools she'll use to do it. Thank you. My name. So, uh, yeah, let me know what you guys thought about that. I think it's really interesting to see all of these consumer AI companies coming in uh, and creating these you know specific use cases for ai we've seen that different companies have been offering this like heygen and a bunch of others and i think it's rather fascinating to see other companies trying to take uh the space because i think now that that's there we're definitely going to be seeing more competition which means better ai footage and again once again some more more issues with relations to i guess you could say privacy relations to deep fakes and of course how this transformative technology is actually used now in more news at yc i don't know if you're going to be excited or uh, i guess you could say not disappointed but rather fearful of this update 
And this is AutoTab. It says AutoTab is a digital robot that you can hire starting at a dollar an hour. It works 24 seven, 365 and does not need lunch breaks. So essentially right here, this is basically an AI agent system that can control your computer and do mainly, right now, it can do mainly repetitive tasks. And this currently runs at a dollar an hour. And I think this is kind of fascinating because although we've had rudimentary systems like this before, I do think that the future of the internet is about to get crazy when we do have agents running around I've been wondering and speculating myself that are some websites going to be banning systems like this because, you know, there have been systems that have been able to click and to do things before, but we are moving to a level that, you know, it seems very, very human-esque. Um, and, you know, another aspect of this is that if these agents are running at a dollar an hour, running 24-7, 365, how fast is the economy going to move, you know, with all these workers? Because, you know, currently things were moving at, you know, nine to five. That's when the economy shifts. And then as, you know, you wind down, it's a global economy and other countries are moving. But if you're able to have, you know, workers, 24 7 365 zero lunch breaks that is going to be an insane productivity boom that we haven't seen and of course another thing is that are we going to see more layoffs because you know when you extrapolate this information out you can see you can hire someone for a dollar an hour and it works 24 7 365 uh, and it does not lead lunch breaks and i think that's pretty crazy that you know that he added that because i think that goes to show that this is of course definitely going to replace possibly some people so I mean, it seems very, very fascinating because they actually talk about all you need to do is literally record yourself doing the task and then it's going to be able to do that task as effectively as you do. So, I mean, this is going to be something that you do need to pay attention to and definitely one I'll be paying attention to as well. And then what we had was Stable Audio 2.0, a new model capable of producing high quality full soundtracks with coherent musical structure up to three minutes long at 441 kilohertz from a single prompt. And this is pretty crazy, so take a look what you think about this compared to Sino. I mean, to be honest, it doesn't really sound bad, but I do think that this might be the year or towards the end of the year where AI music does start to catch on because what we've seen with Suno V3 and a couple of other systems, I think that, you know, it is starting to hit the mainstream a little bit. Then we also had a tweet from Sam Altman stating that movies are going to become video games and video games are going to become something unimaginably better. So this is a very, very cryptic tweet. It might just be a tweet where he's just, you know, venting about something that he's doing or it could just be something that he's thinking about in terms and relations to OpenAI. So this is pretty, pretty incredible. So for some speculation, what this could actually be is that this could actually mean that we are going to get interactive narratives. So AI could enable movies to become more like video games through blurring the lines between what is real. So for example, this could require AI being able to dynamically generate or alter content based on viewer decisions, creating a personalized viewing experience, which would fundamentally change movies forever. We could also get enhanced realism in video games. And as video games evolve to become something unimaginably better, AI could be at the forefront of this transformation. And this might involve creating highly realistic and responsive uh, video games. I mean, you know, video games becoming something unimaginably better could mean that we get AI agents, AI generated content, AI NPCs, pretty much everything that is uh, generative. And then, um, you know, the video games are just entirely personalized or entirely unique, where we could just have these virtually generated worlds that are so immersive and so lifelike that we truly are immersed and are addicted to these games. Now, I think they would be fascinating. And of course, addiction is usually a user problem. But I do think that this tweet does go to show that, you know, Sam Altman does really know how crazy the applications are. And one of the things that we haven't seen take off yet, and one of the things that I would love to see is video games that truly take advantage of generative AI in terms of what's possible with NPCs 
and generative content to allow us to play games in a generative way that are really, really new and effective. And I think the first game to do that very, very effectively is going to be probably a very, very staple title. Now, what was crazy is that it seems that OpenAI slash Sam Altman have been, you know, trying to poach some of Elon Musk's employees. You can see that Tesla's computer vision chief, Ethan Knight, has left Tesla and joined Elon Musk's X.AI company. And Elon Musk says it right here that Ethan was pretty much going to join OpenAI so with either XAI or them. He says they have been aggressively recruiting Tesla engineers with massive compensation offers and have unfortunately been successful in a few cases. And he says Ethan is very talented, but Vision Chief would be overstating things. There are over 200 excellent engineers in the Tesla AI team. And he says that the talent war for AI is the craziest talent war I've ever seen. And this is something that I've talked about before. If you are in the top of your field at AI right now, do you have the very, very nice luxury of being able to go wherever you want? Because AI you know, talent right now is pretty scarce because all of these companies are trying to build the best models, the best systems, and those who are at the very best are getting huge compensation packages because they know that if your company manages to get a state-of-the-art model, it's pretty hard for others to catch up. And of course, it's no surprise that Elon Musk's company um, is getting poached by OpenAI since they have an ongoing feud that has been going on for quite some time. So let me know what you think about 